round of applause for our iconic friend, Betty McGee. We are so happy to have Betty McGee here. Um, so I'm actually gonna pass it to Steph so she can give us a little background on Diafano first and then we'll get started. Hi guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, as I said on the first show, Diafano is a nonprofit organization helping local artists here in Miami. Um, all of Betty's work is gonna be here in the long run and all proceeds go to her. And you have the price list on there, right? Yeah, so yeah, check us out on Instagram if you have any questions, um, if you want more details. Yes super important um, art gallery movement that's supporting the local arts in Miami, something that we definitely need right now as things are changing. Um, so Betty, let's get into it. Let's start from the very beginning. Where are you from? How has that impacted your work? <laughs> I'm from Miami. Um, shout out to Palmetto Bay specifically. Uh, that is the suburb I'm from. Uh, yeah, and Palmetto Bay is sort of the star of the, the series I created specifically for the show called An Uneasy Recline. So, yeah, revisiting the place that I grew up and sort of experimenting with it and kind of wrestling with it, I think, has always been like the inspiration for me, like in the last 10 years of making work. I actually want to follow up with that because that's led to a really interesting thought that I've noticed in your work. There's like this exploration of like liminal spaces, like this thought of returning to a place that used to mean something and now it means something completely different, which I think is something we can all relate to right now in the changing like landscape of Miami. So very prescient like themes being explored here for sure. Um, do you feel like being in Miami Um, that's a big question. I don't know if there's like a guaranteed answer. I think for me, as an artist, uh, being from here... Let me try to get it on. I'll just keep talking. Uh, project. I'll just project. Oh, uh, here, so. <laughs> yeah, I'll use this one. Um, yeah, living here and being a part of the community, I think it's... It goes hand in hand with being a part of the community. I don't think you can do it alone in Miami. And that's the really powerful thing I learned working on this project is art to me has always been a very internal and self-reflective and isolated practice. You know, it's not like you can jam out with people in the same way that like music allows you to have a community, but you know, working with all these different uh, rave organizations and roping my friends into the project who have all helped so much kind of taught me that I think that is the key to being a success in Miami is not uh, yeah, isolating yourself, just being more and more of a part of it. That's what granted me this opportunity even, so yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, that really is beautiful, especially if you are capturing something like the rave scene, the DIY underground, queer spaces that are very fluid, pop up. I was actually just talking about this uh, earlier with someone, how there's not a lot of like permanent venues that cater to this demographic. So you being this sort of like archivist of these really important historical, you know, moments, you are actually making history rather than, you know, just letting it fizzle out into this amnesia. So... Props to you for that. Um, are there any specific like aesthetics or artistic movements that inform your work? Uh, yeah, so um, definitely Dan Golden is one of my greatest inspirations. Um, I love that she documented sort of the bohemian scene in like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And what's really prescient about her work is that she documents kind of the very careless or like the vitality of the beginnings of the scene and then the downfall because of the AIDS crisis. Yeah. So watching her work develop and watching these characters sort of come in and then pass away and often times is really tragic and it, it's so raw. And one of the most beautiful things I heard of her was just that when someone first discovered her, it was like she just had thousands and thousands of photos that she'd collected and she was just doing it as a reflex more than like an end goal. Uh, so I really appreciated that sort of just like leaning into your 
impulses of what to document. Sometimes she'd make a self-portrait, but that's not really what she's known best for, but I like that for her it was just like a, a diary. Um, same with Vivian Meyer. Uh, she also, she was a babysitter who was never famous in her lifetime and someone discovered all of her work after she died at an estate sale. Um, and she again just had like a almost like sickness in how much she needed to document things, like an urgent thing would be taking place and her first reaction was just to grab her camera and take a picture of it. Um, so yeah, I think I like, I like people who really lean into an impulse and then aesthetically, Cindy Sherman, famous self-portraiture um, and Gregory Crudson because of the like mystique of the suburbs, which is like also very present, I think. Yeah. My next question was if there was anybody in your life that inspired you, would you consider these two artists the main people? Or is there anybody personal in your, like in your life that inspires you? Yeah, um, my parents. Uh, they're both really talented visual artists. It's not what they do for a living. They actually are educators, but our house was like half full of just stuff they made in college and they made a collaborative collage where my mom made a geometric collage of my dad's doodles from his notebooks. And yeah, there's, and also on the walls was like me and my siblings, like crappy, like student drawings. And there was just something really beautiful about how like to them, it was really special and unique because of who it came from. And they really encouraged us our whole lives to be creative and, you know, instead of giving us like, an iPad or I guess at the time like a Game Boy or something, my mom would buy me art supplies. So it's just, yeah, for me, I think that was something really beautiful and something I would want to do for my kids too. I love that. Are there any other uh, mediums that you're exploring right now outside of photography? Uh, so prior to the show, I wanted to incorporate drawing and I couldn't really wrap my head around a way to elegantly fuse the two. Um, so I leaned more into photography, but that's when I started making prints. Um, I hadn't done that since college in a dark room. So I started doing cyanotypes, which only require sunlight and not a lot of chemicals. So it's something you can really do at any location with any parameters. I work out of my apartment. So I'm just on the balcony, like exposing things and going in and out and doing test strips. So I definitely want to do more prints and possibly explore how to incorporate drawings into the prints because they kind of, I think they, you, if you can evenly expose a print to fuse the two, it feels more like one piece rather than like scrapping them together and forcing it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because it sort of, uh, you know, makes you question what's, what's real and what's not. You can draw something into the image and then fade it in a way that it looks like it's part of that reality, which I think that push and pull of hyper-realism and surrealism is really present in your work, how you're capturing these really vivid moments that are not really edited, edited post-production, right? You're actually, if anything, doing these very analog things like putting gel and some filters over the lens, but you're not uh, playing with the reality after the fact. You're very simply just pointing out what's there, which is surreal in itself, which I think is really refreshing in this day and age when everything is so post-edited. Yeah, go ahead. I always ask every film photographer this question, um, why film? Because you only shoot with film, right? I'm with both. But all the works you have here is all film? Yeah. Yeah, so tell me why. Um, simply put, I think film just has a much better feel. Uh, the colors are a lot more interesting. They're deeper. They're more vibrant. You can play with the colors on the film stocks you choose. It gives you a different cast of color. So um, a lot of these I shot on Portra, which is great for natural skin tones. Um, and also I just, yeah, I feel like I can much more immediately achieve how something looks in my mind and my eyes when I see it than when I look at a digital photo I took. And after you develop and film, um, scan them, do you do any editing at all? Uh, yeah, so normally for party photos, I don't really edit them a lot, but for... The medium format photos I took here, I did edit, actually, okay, I edited the pool photos a lot, um, and that was partially due to them being mildly overexposed. So 
with film, you can actually get a lot of detail back, which is another bonus over digital. So I pretty much recovered all the detail I thought I lost. And I wanted to balance out the, the whites against the blue cast. But the photo behind us, I barely touched. Um, I pretty much just put my faith in the film lab to scan it as they saw fit. And I was really thrilled with how they did it. So, Can I ask, where do you develop your film? Um, Bellows Film Lab. Um, yeah. They've just been a really reliable film lab. I know there are other film labs in Miami, um, and I actually do want to try developing there, but they got me hooked. They do a good job, so I've just kind of gone with Old Faithful. <laughs> yeah, talk about um, collab. Sorry, I wrapped this around your leg. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> talk about, like, you know, involving other people, you know, collaborating, like you mentioned at the very top of this panel. Uh, you know, with something like film, where it literally takes, like, outsourcing as part of the process. You can't just do it all on your own, like, in your apartment balcony. Sometimes you have to involve other factors, which I think really speaks to the collaborative process uh, that, you, that you employ, which is really cool. Um, tell us a little bit more about your process, though. So you hinted at the fact that you do work uh, at home. Can you tell us more about, like, what vibe your studio has, uh, what sort of process you take from ideation to completion? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, my studio is my home. They're one and the same. So I've, up until this project, kind of secluded everything into a corner, like in my living room, where I have tables, and I have my computer, and I have a scanner, and all my art supplies and stuff. But the nature of printing cyanotypes is just, there's so many stages to printing out a digital negative to lay on the paper to then washing it in my kitchen sink um, and exposing it on the balcony. And I have a clothesline in the middle of my living room with prints just hanging and dripping dry with towels under them. So the line just completely disappeared for this by the end of it because I was just sort of taken over by wanting to do this and do it well. Yeah. I think that informs your work. Do, 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 do you think that, like, maybe... I'm sorry, why are you holding the microphone? <laughs> do, but how do you think that, like, informs your work in the sense of, do you feel more, like, personally connected to, let's say, like, the subjects or uh, the process itself? Do you think you're imbuing it with more of yourself because it's in this very intimate environment? Um, definitely. Um, I always just have my work up even once it's done. My whole apartment is like 99% decorated and stuff I've made. And I like kind of just ruminating on what made me want to make it. And sort of like I'm like quietly writing a cheesy curatorial essay in my head about why my charcoal like nude self-portrait has anything to do with my photography and trying to find solutions. Um, yeah, and especially with a process like cyanotypes, which I'd never done before, it was like I was watching a pot boiling and I was really scared it would boil over. So I was watching it pretty much up until I brought it here to see what changed, how the colors would deepen or lighten and trying to sort of figure it out and track it. So yeah, it was kind of like babysitting almost. <laughs> That's really interesting. It is your baby. The next question is, do you get inspired by different locations, sceneries, or even the rave scene? Does that inspire you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm super inspired by Miami. Um, all different parts of it, parts that I grew up in, to me, have like a obvious nostalgia and... Is it something you carry within you where like you go somewhere and later you get inspired because you think about like what you just experienced or do you ever have like a moment where you're somewhere and you're like, I have an idea, I have a vision? Yeah, I've definitely had ideas like at raves. I think there is, there's something hypnotic obviously about tracks being blended together and not having a distinct end or beginning and... Mm -hmm. Shooting raves is really fun. That, it's the fun part of having a digital camera is I do get instant gratification when I see a shot I love. And it feels really good. And it's just like this serotonin boost that keeps me energized the whole night um, to keep going. And I have weird notes on my phone of like weird poems about how raves in Miami make me feel. And yeah, I think it's all inspiring. I think I struggle to make work in cities that are not Miami. 
because I just don't feel the same connection. And I've gotten called out on that like in photo critiques in school too, that my work always was better if I'd come home from break. <laughs> That is really interesting. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, devoting your, at least, you know, this phase of your career to really capturing the essence of where you're from. I mean, that's highly personal. And I wanted to actually uh, piggyback off of that thought you had about the whole transcendental religious experience that you're describing at these raves, because you definitely do see that, especially in, I barely know these people of uh, 2022 over there. It's really long, sort of like, a series of snippets of different moments sort of uh, weaved together into like this simultaneous like moment that's happening all at once in this really long but cohesive piece. I think it's super interesting the methods that you employ. Um, it reminds me of this photographer, Claudia Andelhar, uh, who's shown at the ICA and I think at Piero Akshigari, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and I think there's this sort of beauty to the analog method that you chose of putting gels and filters over the lens um, and sort of having that transcendental, like those blue people <laughs> over there towards the end of the snippet, you know, like those people don't actually look like that, but you're sort of, it's like you're capturing their aura almost, that sort of blurry imperfection that is so unique to that moment and to your work. And then also juxtaposed with the very hyper real photo next to it that I would describe as editorial with how high resolution it is. It's just yeah. very much capturing this, zooming in and out these really uh, introspective moments that you have in a place where, you know, we're leaning into hedonism, but we're also tapping into this very primal, but yet very transcendental religious experience as an organism, as a, as a moving organism together, you know, and I think that's really amazing um, and timeless work. I think, you know, some of these pictures look like they're from the 90s. Some of them look like futuristic almost. I think these pictures are always going to stand the test of time, for sure. I feel like raves mean something different to everybody and I feel like this piece kind of captures all those different meanings in one yeah. yeah like there's some it's some of them are chaotic some of them there's a making out you know love a close-up you know having fun there's all these different elements and different things that are in that happens inside one room in one party and I think this piece is really important <laughs> oh wait sorry yeah, right. <laughs> we were just complimenting you. <laughs> yeah, um, so what other, what, tell us more about the other themes that you're exploring in this work. Um, if there's anything you want to point out in specifics. Uh, yeah, I think a driving force is time. Photo is a time-based medium. Um, time is applied to exposing a single image, to printing an image. A cyanotype takes like 18 to 27 minutes to fully register in the paper. So there's an element of time there. There's the element in the rave photos where some are with flash and longer exposure. So you get sort of like a trail of somebody's body moving in space. And initially that was because the camera I was shooting on was, the flash was so bad that I couldn't get like a visible image. So I started making my exposure times longer and longer. And it ended up really working for me and kind of like being my signature. Um, but yeah, time and how time can bottleneck sort of into a space. So in, in raves, I feel like the ephemeral quality allows time to flow through it and then like go back into the world. Whereas like a home, um, for instance, my grandma's home where we shot the self portraits, uh, that's a place where time has sort of gotten congested and not had a release. And I think you can like sense it in the air, especially for me because I spent a lot of time there my whole life. So. I have my own connection and biases about it, but I mean, there are just a million indexes of time around it. You can see all the things my grandma's accumulated. It's like a museum, but a very weird museum with strange priorities of what needs to be preserved. Like her laptop has like weird jokes. She's printed out and taped to the top of the laptop. And um, yeah, so I think time to me is like, I don't know, it's like the spiritual connection for all the works. You have three series going on here, right? And they're all under the un I'm so sorry, what is it? An, the, uneasy an uneasy recline. Can you tell me how these three series fit under this one umbrella that you made? 
and how they kind of relate to each other? Sure. So for me, an uneasy recline, it's... So I've, I've always wanted to incorporate and unite these works like together, and I feel like these ideas of youth and time and sort of how we like relate to other people kind of connected all of them to me. There's like a, a battle between uh, like latent teenage rebellion and then like early retirement in the self-portrait series where I'm like at once like defiling a space but then also like embodying this sort of like homebody who's like already relinquished her youth and I, for me that was because the the place itself had that like mental effect and it was like just an obvious way to channel that like there's like this madness of having time kept so close and then on the opposite of that you have raves which are like all about connecting with other people so I liked that there was this like isolation versus connectedness but still like for me I feel like I am still sort of a voyeur in these spaces like there's a difference between shooting it and being at the party just to be there um, like I am on the job and I'm enjoying I love that role I also love not being in that role to really fall into something but um so for me I felt like it was good to sort of acknowledge like in a har I hardly know these people was a disclaimer to say I don't really know these people that well I couldn't tell you all their names but I have these intimate photos of them and because I've been I've been watching them in the crowd and I, I thought what they're doing in that second was really awesome so I needed to take a picture and then on the other side to have this sort of loneliness and self-reflection um and then for me, the cyanotypes, which will fade over time because they're sensitive to sunlight and in the path of light, kind of connected these ideas of like ephemerality and permanence. And this person who I photographed, whose name is Damien, um, I was just completely mesmerized by his performance that night and probably shot even more than what I'm showing in this. He's also included twice in the panorama. So I think there's like an ability to have a state of reverence for people if you don't know them well. So for me, it was like, who is this beautiful stranger like soaring like high heights in a rave? And it like kind of granted me the ability to not have a direct association and see them as a subject rather than like have biases about how I'm supposed to represent them. So when you go out, do you sometimes go out to the rave with your camera on you? Or is it sort of like... You only do it as a job, that. right? Or do you take them when you're yeah, not getting paid? Not so them? much anymore, honestly. Um, I think I, I get my fill on the job. And it's not a job to me. It's, it's, a, it's a joy and it's an honor to be allowed to bring my camera into a space and be entrusted to, you know, like it is intimate. I'm getting intimate photos of people and I'm relieved that people take kindly to it and, you know, aren't like back the hell off so I think it's like also partly a respect thing if somebody else is on a gig I don't want to take their shot away from them be in their way and I want to just let loose and not worry about all my gear and stuff I don't want to worry about losing a camera <laughs> since you're saying this how do you feel about when you're shooting and you're on a job and there's other people taking pictures um fine I feel like now I have backup um, actually, coincidentally, the one time that I was at a gig that was kind of loaded with photographers because I got booked by the person putting on the party, but then the people DJ, DJing also brought in their own photographers. So we had like three people sort of cornering the room. And it actually was such a blessing because my camera flash got knocked off like in the crowd. And so I couldn't shoot the rest of it. And I was like, well, luckily you have like two other photographers on site. So just pay me for the first hour. <laughs> Do you feel like there should be more photographers like capturing the scene? I don't see why not. I don't think there sh should be a limit of like how many is enough or too little. I think whoever really has good intentions and has, shares in the instinct of, oh my God, this one moment is so special and needs to be preserved should do it. I think more people should be allowed with cameras into spaces. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but some venues are really tricky about even the smallest camera, and I, I don't see the reason. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, there's some parties where they'll even put a sticker on your phone yeah. to not. That's it. That's a different. Yeah. <laughs> for the underground, go off. For big clubs, I don't. I don't think you should have the the copyright on people's image. At like an underground rave, I like the idea of don't be on your phone. Like right. I think that's cool, but. Yeah, I think when big clubs are like, we only want our photographer to take pictures of what we find sexy and marketable is like a really weird way to, yeah, market like what even isn't possibly the full reality of what your venue does. Not everyone can be the Burgine. <laughs> Not everyone. So what's next for you, Betty? What's next on the docket? Um, next for me is probably helping my good friend Hunter out on his next project. Uh, he's been um, like such an awesome creative partner this past year. And we only became friends like a year ago, but he helped me a lot with this. So thank you, Hunter. And thank you, Dylan, for helping so much as well. And thank you to my friend Nick, who also helped us a lot shooting the self-portraits. But yeah, I think next month is to work on a new project with him and continue exploring printing and you'll definitely see me at more uh, Prohibita parties and mm -hmm. other gigs. So I'll see people on the dance floor. Yes, Hunter does films. Is that something that you're interested in doing? Because you're, one of the series has a storyline. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to know if maybe one day we'll see a film from you. Um, a film from me and Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> a Not film that I, I helped him write, but... <laughs> For me, I mean, photography is my medium and I love it. And um, I liked having a film approach to a shoot. That was something that was totally new. And I've always been like a, to like a lone wolf in photography. So to rope in a team and open myself up to other people's opinions and help, uh, these wouldn't have been possible without a team behind me. So I think that really taught me a good lesson and sort of like the production I can push myself to have, but I want it to be for an image, not for a video, but I enjoy doing video too. As just as a final note to end on, we at uh, Diafano and Miami Art Scene really want to encourage more independent artists to saturate the scene. We want more perspectives that aren't just the, you know, 1% of the art world. So tell us, do you have any advice for future aspiring artists? Yes, I think it's uh, have faith in yourself because um, I think the biggest lesson for me was that a lot more people had faith in me than I did in myself. And yeah, I've been so like touched by, I don't know, I was surprised, I surprised myself with this and I'm like, I'm sad that I didn't have that trust in myself before this, but I'm happy that I have it now. Um, so I would say to people who are doubting whether or not they should keep going or if they're not talented enough to really dedicate themselves to something like that, I'd say don't listen to that negative part of your head because it's, it's not true and it's, it's like just a waste of energy. I mean, I think it's important to have community and have people that support you. I think in times where you are in doubt, and that's just realistic, you know, everybody goes through that. It's nice to have like those people that make you keep going, you know? Yeah, I think, yeah, also share your work because I think if you keep it all to yourself and criticize it, nobody else can ever give you another opinion. Right. Yes. Exactly. Amen. Betty McGee, everybody. Give her a round of applause. Awesome. So right before we head out, we just want to know, where can we find you on Instagram? What's your website? Give us the plugs. <laughs> my Instagram is bath.pdf. My website is under construction, so don't look for it. <laughs> I just want to give a big thank you before we turn these off to Shotgun for the Space, Miami Community Radio for um, broadcasting, and Concreta Sala too, which is Priscilla. She's in Brazil right now. She couldn't be here, but yes. Thank you, and thank you for everybody thank that's here. Thank you, Betty. See you next time. <laughs>